Welcome to another study of the book of Acts. I'm thankful that you're here. We're going to be looking in Acts chapter 24, as you can see there on the screen. And uh, before we begin, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father, we're thankful for another day that you've given us. We're thankful for the blessings of this day. We're thankful, Father, for your word and for the beauty of your word and as it reveals you and your character and your love. <clears throat> Father, we're also thankful for the Word who became flesh and dwelled among us, and we see His glory as revealed in the Scriptures. We pray that you'll be with us as we study this book of Acts. We pray, Father, that we will learn to be more like you. Thank you for Jesus. Forgive us of our sins. Go with us. Continue to be with our world. And at the end of this life, we're longing to be with you. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so if you will look there, <clears throat> we are in Acts 24. So if you'll be turning your Bibles to Acts chapter 24, we're going to break this down into three sections. Well, three or four, I can't remember on my slides here. But the first section is, uh, <clears throat> that's the whole uh, chapter there. It's Paul before the governor Felix. And the first section is chapter 24, 1 through 9. I'm reading from the NIV. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. If you remember in chapter 23, the Roman commander Claudius Lysias had commanded the Jewish leaders uh, to try Paul and that didn't go well and now he is going to go to Caesarea to stand before the governor and they arrived in Caesarea five days later and among them was the high priest Ananias the one who ordered Paul to be struck on the face you remember and he with him were other key leadership uh, men and lawyer named Tertullus, and he's the prosecuting attorney um, in this case. And so they would tell he he would stand before Felix, and on behalf of the other rulers, he would tell he would tell the charges to Governor Felix that they had against Paul. Felix would be the judge. Now he began with flattery, complimenting Felix. And really, these, these things that he mentions were things that everybody knew did not characterize Felix. He said that Felix had brought quietness to the nation, and yet Felix, as a governor, is marked by a lot of strife. His rule was marked by a lot of strife. Let's talk a little bit about Felix. There's a coin or a picture of a coin with his face on it. He was originally a slave and probably in the service of Antonia, who was the mother of the Emperor Claudius. She granted him freedom, and then he rose up in the ranks of uh, Roman society. And he won such favor that Claudius uh, raised him in the army to high command, and then in the year 52, AD 52, to being governor of Judea. So, but from the beginning of his time in office, he was ruthless in dealing with those who opposed him. Josephus, a Jewish writer, talks about Felix's career, and he says that his early years, he, was, uh, he wanted to get rid of all the troublemakers 
uh, in the nation. He, he was harsh. He was heavy-handed. He uh, didn't have a very good public reputation among the people. The Jewish high priest, Jonathan, admonished him that uh, this is going to cause uh, some public uh, discord if you keep going this way. But instead, Felix had Jonathan assassinated by hired men who actually went into the temple disguised as worshipers. Throughout his governorship, it, his rulership was characterized by unrest. The ancient Roman historian Tacitus summarized Felix and he said that he practiced every kind of cruelty and lust, wielding the power of a king with all the instinct, instincts of a slave. And so that's who Paul's standing for. Tertullus, as the prosecuting attorney, is standing there. <clears throat> and he has this crafted speech. And he is, in a sense, the Jewish leadership is signaling to Felix that we know you're not too popular now, but we're willing to support you if you'll take our side against Paul. And the charges against Paul are, are vague. He says that he was a that he is a troublemaker, a pestilent fellow. He provokes un, unrest, civil unrest, and violence. And there are a lot of troublemakers during this this time. And the Romans had to come in and restore order. And so this is something to just to uh, win a sympathetic hearing with this Roman governor. Also, he begins there that uh, we, we enjoyed a long period of peace under you, he says in, in verse 2. If Felix accepts that praise as a peacemaker, then he, won't, he would want to deal severely with somebody like Paul, who was a real troublemaker. Tertullus said that he was, in verse 5, that Paul was a ring leader of the Nazarene sect. And each of these words is carefully chosen. He identifies Paul as a pest or a plague. He's a ring leader. That's like he's a military leader in this sect. Uh, the word sect, uh, we have our word heresy that comes from that. It originally meant a party that's within a, a bigger party or part of a subgroup of a larger party. Uh, but in Paul's day, it, star it has a negative connotation. And notice he says that he is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. And that has derogatory overtones. It's referring to Nazareth, where Jesus was, was from. And so his followers are, are Nazarenes. They follow this man from Nazareth. The, at this point, the religion of the Jews was not illegal, according to the Roman government. They granted it toleration and they gave it certain rights. But the Jewish leaders didn't accept the church as having legal standing because they didn't see it as an offshoot or in any way related to the Jewish religion. And so he says that the Nazarene, he, the, he's a ringleader in the Nazarene sect. That's the idea to brand it as kind of illegal in the minds of this, of this governor. It's to arouse his suspicion of the church. It's a political movement that's that's gaining over here. And so you need to do something, Felix, about that. Finally, he says in verse six, he Paul even tried to desecrate the temple. So we, we seized him. And the Romans recognized the right of the Jewish people to protect the temple from from anything or anyone that they regarded as a, a defilement. Um, you remember Claudius Lysias this riot is about to occur in the temple and to say that we as Jewish leaders couldn't control that and then maintain peace, that's a dangerous thing. So he defends the leaders with a lie. He says that we arrested Paul in a proper manner and if there's a riot, then the Romans called it. They, they caused that, light, uh, that riot. Um, and the, you remember earlier, Claudius Lysias wrote a letter. This is the end of chapter 23, and he basically lied to his superiors. Tertullius' speech here is filled with lies as well. Usual uh, reason or motivation for people to lie uh, 
is to protect themselves or to promote themselves. And that's, that's the reason behind this lie here and of the Jewish leaders. All right, look at uh, Acts 24, and we're going to read verses 10 through 16 now. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Paul's a Roman citizen, and so he has the right and the privilege of speaking in his own defense. And he too starts with words of tribute to Felix. Anything else than that would be uh, disrespectful and improper during this time. Yet Paul avoids flattery. The only merit that he applauds in Felix is, is his experience as a judge. He says, you've sat in this role for many years and you're qualified to weigh the accusations in this. Felix may well have been in Palestine for uh, several years. First in the year, years 48 through 52, he was an administrator in Samaria. And then in 52, AD 52, to the time of Paul's trial here, 58 roughly, he was governor of Judea. Paul is respectful, and this teaches us that though proclaiming a controversial message might bring uproar, the messengers themselves always need to be peace-loving, respectful, upright, and law-abiding. Then Paul replies to the charges one by one. First, in response to the charge that he's a raiser of sedition, he points out, it's just been 12 days since I've been in Jerusalem. It's now five days after I came to Caesarea. So I spent about a week in the city. And I didn't do anything there to cause trouble. I came to the city to worship, he says. And I conducted myself and there was, there was no problem. And the accusers didn't find me arguing with anybody in the street or in the synagogue. And he says, I was just there briefly. Luke, if we look at the book of Acts, gives us a day-by-day -day record of Paul's events once he gets to Jerusalem. Uh, the 12 days he talks about here, I guess excludes his day of arrival. Then the 12 days begin. And so on day one, he met with James. That's in Acts 21, verse 18. Then days two through five are four days of purification. Day five is the day of the riot in Acts 21, 26 and 27. Or I'm sorry, 21, 27. And then day six is his day before the Sanhedrin. Day seven is the day of the plot to, to kill and murder Paul. Day eight is his day of arrival in Caesarea. Nine, days nine through 11 or these three intervening days, and then day 12 is the day of this trial after five days. So Paul says, I was in Jerusalem for a short period of time. Second thing that Paul does is he acknowledges that he is a Christian, but he, de he denies that he belongs to an illegal sect. He faithfully has followed the teaching of the Hebrew Scriptures. In matters of worship and conscience, I haven't departed from anything, he says, that I've inherited as a son of Israel. I retain all the beliefs of my fathers. I lived in good conscience, perfect conscience to the moral law. And he insists that the problem is his belief in the resurrection of the dead. 
And that's not a heret uh, something that's a her heretical or heresy. Even many of his enemies held the same belief. And he says, my strongest desire is to meet the obligations of God and of humans and to walk uprightly so my conscience won't uh, hold me guilty. So he says here in, in um, 24, 16, that I have, always, I have always a conscience that's void of offense toward God and toward humans. Remember back in chapter 23, verse 1, he says, I've lived in good conscience before God until this day. Paul's teaching here, or his words here, teaches that Christianity is, in the end, not a betrayal of the Hebrew Scriptures, but a fulfillment of this faith that comes out of the Hebrew Scriptures. He doesn't deny being a follower of the way, and that's regarded by some people as, as a sect, but he refuses to say that that way, and by the way, the word way is found in the book of Acts several times, and uh, it goes back to Jesus when he says, I am the way. But Paul refuses to acknowledge that that way is a departure from true Judaism. He even says here in verse 14, I believe everything that is in accordance with the law, and that is written in the prophets. There's an ancient threefold designation of the Hebrew Scriptures. Torah, Law, Nevi'im, Prophets, Ketuvim, Writings. That is made into an acronym, Tanakh, T-A-N-A-K. This is probably shorthand for that. He's, he's saying, I believe everything that the Hebrew Scriptures teach. And they all point to Christ, and I worship the God of our ancestors. Now, look at verses 17 through 21. As Paul is here uh, before Agrippa giving this, this response. But 17 through 21, he answers another charge. Verse 17, after an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. This is addressing that third charge that he profaned the temple. And he says, far from that, I was bringing gifts, alms, money to be distributed among the poor. I was bringing offerings. Those would be worship offerings. When he was rested in the temple compound, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He wasn't stirring up a crowd. He wasn't agitating. Uh, it wasn't controversy. And so that's the evidence that's here before you, Felix. If, if they say, I did this, then they need to produce witnesses. And then he says, I hold to the resurrection. Maybe that's it. Now, Paul's introduction of the resurrection here is not only good legal defense, but it's also good evangelism. To speak of the final accounting before God, the eternal destiny that comes from that, points to, to certainties of our human existence. Many people run away from that, but the scriptures teach that there is coming a judgment. There is coming this, this resurrection of all. Uh, the idea is that Felix needs to hear this. Everybody there in that room needed to hear it. And so Paul concludes his defense. Now look at verses 22 and 23. We'll read those. Then this is Felix's response. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Notice there, verse 22, Felix was, Luke tells us, well acquainted with the way. He was an experienced governor. He not only understood Judaism, but he also understood the way. That's Christianity. Felix was a good man to hear Paul's case because he was informed 
about Christianity. Perhaps his acquaintance came from his wife, Drusilla. She was the youngest daughter of Herod Agrippa, and that's the same Herod that beheaded James back in Acts chapter 12. She was six years old when her father died, and you read about the death of her father in Acts chapter 12. She was familiar with the customs of the Jewish people. Her father murdered James. Her great uncle was Herod Antipas, and he killed John the Baptist. Her great-grandfather was Herod the Great, who killed the babies of Bethlehem. And so Felix's wife is Drusilla, and however Felix came to knowledge of the way, we don't know, but um, he perceived some of this is false. Maybe some of this is exaggerated, but he sidestepped the verdict here. <clears throat> not going to find Paul guilty, but I'm not going to let him go at this time. He's procrastinating. We'll, I'll put this matter off and we'll talk about it later when Claudius Lysias comes. It's like um, it was an elected office, but uh, Felix as a governor knows that favoring Paul will win him a few votes at election time, but he also knows that favoring the Jews will gain him many votes, but he has, he's not willing to come down on either side right now. Now let's look at uh, the last verses of the chapter. Acts 24, verse 24 through 27. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul, listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. So a while later, Felix and Drusilla summoned Paul to explain further his faith in Christ. Drusilla, his wife, is only about 20 years old at this time, probably. Drusilla was in her second marriage. Felix enticed her to leave her first husband. He was a king of a small kingdom in Syria. And it shows how corrupt these leaders were. Drusilla might have been Felix's second wife. His first was also named Drusilla. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, his third wife, after this Drusilla, that he married la later, uh, perhaps after the death of the second Drusilla. But they sent for Paul. Now, whether they want to hear Paul out of genuine interest in the message or just out of curiosity, why he's causing so much trouble, we, we don't know. But Paul preached to them boldly, both of them. What did he preach? Well, he preached faith, his faith in Christ, and he preached righteousness, self-control, and the judgment of to come. Even though Paul's life is at the mercy of Felix, he preached that God would hold all humans accountable for their lives and judge their, their sins. And he defines sin as the opposite of righteousness and self-control. And that's all in light of the judgment to come. Now this message brought a little bit of, of guilt to the conscience of Felix because it says he trembled in fear. But he sent Paul away, and he promised to call him back. And he kept his promise, but uh, he spoke to him often, but he had mixed motives. He thought Paul would give, could give him a bribe. I mean, you remember Paul had been gathering a collection for this, the poor in Jerusalem. Perhaps he thinks, well, Paul has people he can get some money about this. But Felix says, when I have a convenient time, I'll, I'll send for you. Indecision is a decision. It's a choice to remain where we are. That's what Felix did outside of God's, God's grace with the condemnation of, of the judgment to come. And so Paul waited in, in, in jail, in Roman custody. Finally, Felix was removed from office and he was replaced by Portius Festus. And we'll talk about him next week when we get into chapter 25. But notice it's after two years that Luke tells us uh, Felix could have released Paul 
when he left, but but he didn't. Um, the last thing Felix wanted to do would be to antagonize the Jews by setting Paul free. Now let's um, <clears throat> let's close with this: God's ways are not our ways. That's what we've been seeing in the Book of Acts. But God keeps His promises. God told Paul that he would stand before kings. That's back in chapter nine, verse fifteen of Acts. He has, and he'll stand before others. God told Paul that he would bear witness in Rome, just as he has done in Jerusalem. That's chapter 23 of Acts, verse 11. He'll soon be on his way to Rome. God always has a way of working his will, and his will is always perfect. Now, why did God allow Paul to remain here in confinement for two whole, whole years, unable to carry out his work? Well, who is to say that Paul is not continuing to carry out God's work while he's here these two whole years? It might just look different. Uh, lest we think that his time in the prison in Caesarea was a total waste, remember, during those two years, Felix continually met with Paul. He heard the gospel each time. Another possible reason is that it gave Luke time to research uh, the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. You can imagine meeting with Paul many times during those two years. Another purpose that some have suggested is that it gave Paul time to write. Some scholars argue, it's not it's certain, but it's a possibility that Paul that is in Caesarea here and during those two years is when he wrote his prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. But we, we, don't, we don't know, but God is still working through Paul. Many times, more than a dozen times in the Psalms, the psalmist asks God, how long? And he's told to wait patiently. And as this waiting, this waiting is for a purpose. God is always working in that. When God sets us aside and we might feel useless in the work of the kingdom, it may be that he's reserving us for, for another work or a quiet work. It may be uh, one way to view our current situation. It may be in preparation for greater work. If you look at our time now, many have been posting sermons and classes online. Many have used this opportunity and maybe that God is, is working, and I, well, I know that God is working in that. Soon we'll be back together. We're planning at uh, Union Grove to be back on Sunday at 11 o'clock. Uh, but God is working in all of this. If it's not writing or praying or encouraging others, it may be for our own spiritual needs. Yet, there is a difference between divine delay and human procrastination. From God's point of view, Paul's two years here in Caesarea is a divine delay. From Felix's point of view, his failure to release Paul was procrastination and greed. And his procrastination resulted in Felix hearing the gospel a number of times, but he never seems, as far as we know, to have decided to, to put his trust in Christ and obey the, the good news. His greater knowledge only increased his judgment. And so there is a tragedy of procrastination. All of us are sinners. We deserve eternal punishment. There's nothing we can do to earn the righteousness of God or to contribute to our salvation. But God so loved us that he gave a Savior. He sent Christ to be our Savior. And so by obeying the gospel, turning from sin, turning to Christ in living faith, confessing his name and being immersed, then we become children of God. And what this text is teaching us, among other things, but I think probably the most important thing is don't procrastinate <clears throat> to get yourself right with God. Don't delay because that day of opportunity will end as it did for Felix. Let's bow again as we close. Dear Father, thank you for this passage in Acts 24. We pray, Father, <clears throat> that we will learn um, the importance of obeying you and op uh, the importance of listening to you. And we thank you, Father, for the Savior we have in Christ.
thank you again for all the goodness, all the things you give us, and especially for Christ. Forgive us of our sins and go with us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.